Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my Stagey YouTube channel. If you are meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I'm also a professional theatre critic based here in the UK and a content creator on YouTube. Today I'm going to be talking to you all about Bonnie and Clyde, the most wanted West End musical which has just opened at the Garrick Theatre. So this production of the show was previously seen last year at the Arts Theatre, starring the same two leads, Jordan Luke Gage and Francis Maley McCann. It is now reopened at a new venue, the Garrick, and you might have expected this to just be the same production, but not only are there a few different cast members joining Bonnie and Clyde this time around, but there are several changes to the show, to the characters, to the set design, to the aesthetics, to the material as well. A great many things have changed about the show, so as well as telling you about what those changes are, I'm going to be talking to you about how they have affected the show and whether I think they have made it better or worse in each instance. I'm also going to be telling you about the performances and what I think about the show in this new venue. So stay tuned, we're going to talk about all of this today. If you enjoy today's review video, make sure to subscribe to my Stagey YouTube channel. And if you want to be able to see my videos a little bit earlier than everyone else and see some of my exclusive content as well, you can sign up to become one of my YouTube members at the first link in the description for just £2.99 a month. At the second link, you can also sign up for a free account with ShowScore, where not only can you follow all of the written reviews that I have done for sites like Broadway World UK and What'sOnStage.com, but you can also create your own free profile and review the shows that you have seen for your Yourself. Now, let's talk about Bonnie and Clyde. So a little bit of backstory here. Bonnie and Clyde is a musical written by Frank Wildhorn, Don Black, and Ivan Menschel. It was first seen on Broadway back in 2011, I believe. It subsequently came over here to the UK many years later. We had a concert version of it um, starring Jeremy Jordan and current Bonnie Francis Maley McCann in January of last year, and that then launched a full production at the Arts Theatre. That production was always going to be a limited run because the theatre had a new tenant that was scheduled to come in after Bonnie and Clyde, the Choir of Man, who are currently still playing at the Arts Theatre. But while they were at the Arts, Bonnie and Clyde managed to attain a sizable fan following, so sizable that they also won the Watson Stage Award this year for the best new musical. And so with all of that social momentum, they have now opened a new production at the Garrick Theatre. I say a new production is broadly similar, but like I said in my introduction, there have been changes. If you know nothing about the plot of Bonnie and Clyde, this is based on the actual historical people. They were outlaws, they were bank robbers, they were murderers, and we are learning more about their lives and how this came to be and how they met each other, and the gritty, passionate romance beneath all of the bloodshed, if you like. And also about the other characters who are sort of sucked into their orbit, their families, their admirers. And so it's a very bold theatricalization of their lives. It's got a great score by Frank Wildhorn and Don Black. It has some really great anthems. Ivan Menchel, the book writer, does a great job of making these characters relatable in spite of the crimes that they commit in front of us throughout the show and explaining a little bit more about how they reached that place in a more understandable way. And there's something really compelling about this show, as evidenced by this fan base that it's managed to attain, many of whom are very young people, which is interesting. I think we could make a whole nother video talking about why young people are gravitating towards Bonnie and Clyde, but it is definitely passionate and explosive. But what do I actually think of the show? Stay tuned to find out. So this for me remains a four star production. I gave it four stars when it was at the arts. It's still a four star for me now. Interestingly, with the changes that have been made, I think some of them are for the better and some of them may be a little bit worse. The cast, I still very much enjoy. The material is more or less the same. And I think it does well up to a certain point. I think there are moments where the material is limited and you have songs like Made in America that opens the second act. And it really makes you think, gosh, I wish the book had more capacity to explore these issues because that song makes a very compelling point about addressing the fact that they've turned to crime 
because of the austerity that they've grown up in, because they grew up in poverty, and they're really victims of this class system that they can't escape from. And we have interesting moments throughout the show. Uh, there's a point where they're holding up a bank, and the bank has no money because the bank is broke. And Clyde gets incredibly frustrated because he says the bank has been taking everything from everyone he knows for years. How can they have no money? And there's just such interesting social points that I wish we had more commentary on. I wish we could expand on those moments rather than having a few extra songs that broadly say the same thing. Because there are parts of the script that drive us up to these moral quandaries, and you have the police talking about people believing them to be heroes, and we kind of a little bit come to understand the public perception of Bonnie and Clyde, even as they're holding up this bank, there's someone who's so amazed to see them there that he asks for an autograph. And we have a conversation between police officers where they are frustrated that that is what public opinion has become. But that's another thing that we don't get to explore nearly as much as I would like for us to. I think there are more rewarding things we could find in this story rather than just doing the most obvious biographical route through their lives. And I think maybe there are more nuanced emotional points we can find rather than just like death is harrowing and bad and love is enduring. Those seem to be like the big bullet points of the show. To be a little bit more specific about my thoughts about this latest run of the show, let me tell you about the changes that have been made. So going from the arts to the Garrick, it's a bigger theatre. I love the signage that they've done on the outside with this bullet hole effect with the heart with Bonnie and Clyde. I think that looks fantastic. I love the various different curtains that you see throughout the show. This is projected before the first act and an actual curtain in the second with this blood-stained American flag. I think that's brilliant. I think that's a brilliant metaphor for Bonnie and Clyde, especially with the song Made in America that happens at the start of the second act. I think that's a really important thematic song for this show. Going into the actual show itself, as soon as it starts, we have a little bit of new dialogue at the beginning. And it's interesting, the show is framed with a character called Ted. He is a member of the West Dallas Police, and he grew up with Bonnie Parker, and he evidently still holds a torch for her very much. She does not reciprocate those feelings, and she ends up meeting and falling in love with Clyde. He is sort of a spectator to all of this. He grows increasingly frustrated and concerned for her well-being, and then when he is part of the team that is charged with trying to hunt down and kill them, he is obviously conflicted about this. Now, Ordinarily, near the end of the show, and there are going to be spoilers, my gosh, if I haven't told you already, there are spoilers aplenty in this review. Normally at the end of the show, he is instrumental in helping to devise a plan to intercept them when they are driving home to meet their families. That whole scene is gone, so we don't really see or come to understand how they were eventually killed, we just know that they were, because that's how the show starts with a description of the way that they were shot. And he talks about even after they'd been shot so many times, he'd naively hoped that Bonnie might still be alive. That's one of the first things that we see in the show. And then it ends with him walking on uh, to see them both in the car, very dead, quite dead. I don't know if this gives him an overinflated sense of importance as a character within the show, because I do feel like it really, it ought to be about the two of them. There's nothing to suggest that there's a more powerful narrative to be found than one that is just about the two of them. And he's very much this secondary character who has a tremendous affection for Bonnie, but I don't know why we begin and end with him. It's a powerful emotional visual to see how distressed he is by this, but I don't know that that's necessarily the right way to frame the story. Also, when he's coming on at the end, they flash up a black and white photograph of the actual Bonnie and Clyde. And I don't know how I feel about this, because it's the kind of thing a West End show would do when it's based on real people and it wants you to think about how important that is. Um, like, remember them, remember their story. This is part of their legacy. And I'm like, they very much did kill people. The show has done a great job of explaining why that is and helping to humanize them as characters, but they did still very much do a lot of murderous crimes. So the whole like memorable black and white photograph thing at the end, I don't know if that sat entirely right with me. Going back to the beginning of the show, what used to happen is you would have children playing young Bonnie and Clyde coming on and they would start a song and then get this lovely transformation moment, very magical musical theater opening number where adult Bonnie and Clyde would run on. I really liked the way that this was done 
before, both in the score with the transition moment and with the way that it was staged at the Arts Theatre. In this one, they have evidently decided that children are too expensive when you have to cast them three at a time to alternate the role, as well as chaperones and everything else that comes with that, so they have cut the kids from this production completely. At the moments where you would then see the child actors used later in the show, those are obviously also gone as well, and the script has been adjusted accordingly. But no kids in the beginning in the song picture show. Instead, we have Bonnie and Clyde playing younger versions of themselves. I don't know how I feel about this. I think the song and the entrance is definitely less powerful for that. I don't know that I mind that they're playing younger versions of themselves because seeing them in a more naive and innocent light I guess it's more powerful because it juxtaposes the way that we've just viewed them and the way that we're going to come to see them over the course of the show. And that's the point of having the children there is to contrast that innocence with what they go on to become. But I also feel like having them play kids when they're obviously not flies in the face of the gritty realism with which the rest of the show is directed. It's very much not this kind of fantastical vibe for the rest of the proceedings, so it seems a little bit odd in that moment. For the Arts Theatre run, they had added back in a previously cut song between Bonnie and Ted. So this song was written, it got cut for Broadway, and then it got added in for the Arts Theatre, and it's gone again. The song has been cut again. They cannot make their minds up about this song. I don't think it added anything necessarily, so I don't mourn the loss of that song particularly where they have added a little bit, I believe, is on the end of God's Arms Are Always Open. I think, I'm sure this is different to how it was before because it's now an entire gospel dance break moment. I think at the very least the staging must be different, but that number felt like it packed a tremendous amount more punch than the last time I saw it. More on the individual performances later. There's a couple of new set pieces, so we have various scenes that take place on the exterior of Bonnie's house, often between her and her mother, and we just see a projection of a house and this front step unit that comes on to one side in front of a gauze curtain. There's a new scene that happens towards the end of the show between Bonnie's mother and Ted, when Bonnie's mother explains to him that she's already kind of come to terms with the fact that Bonnie is going to die because of the life that she has chosen. In fact, there are various new scenes throughout the show. There's been an awful lot of changes to the book. There's a new scene in the second act between Bonnie and Blanche where they get this very different interaction. And I enjoy that because those characters have always had a very deliciously contemptuous relationship. And it's nice to get to explore that a little bit more. I could be lying about this, but I'm sure that in the song Made in America, where Clyde used to be confronted by a police officer with a gun and he ended up having to shoot him uh, in order to survive the encounter basically and that's the first person that he kills while committing a robbery. I'm sure there used to be a little bit more there or just like a little bit of dialogue and we used to see more of that moment but now it happens so briefly which feels disappointing because that's such a pivotal moment for him as a character. It gets referenced a whole lot later, and I just feel like I want it to have a little bit more status. It feels rushed. I'm racking my brain to think of some of the other changes. Frances Mayley McCann has some new wigs. That's nice for her. Oh, there's these new columns as well. I wasn't sure about how I felt about the column at first, but then I liked them. They have these two new columns that come down just to show a little bit of variety of location. The staging has been tightened up a little bit. I think Generally, in the direction of the visuals and the staging, everything just feels a little bit more improved. Do I think it plays as well to the larger space of the Garrick Theatre? That I don't know. I was very close to the stage, so I didn't have any kind of an issue. I did hear that if you're sat sort of further back and wider to the stage, then the projections that fall across two screens at different depths don't necessarily line up. I was in the middle. I didn't have that problem, but something to be aware of if you're going to be further back and to the side, because they are very reliant on projections. And it's some lovely projection design, I will say. Some of the best projection design I think I've seen in a theatre. It's chilling, and it's beautiful, and it's... It's, they do some, some really great looking things. Shout out to Nina Dunn for the video designs. But I'm also curious about how well the show plays when you're much further back. It feels like it's one that might benefit from a smaller, tighter, more intimate and claustrophobic kind of a space. Nick Winston was the director and choreographer of this production. I've already mentioned God's Arms Are Always Open, which was a whole moment. I loved the way that that was staged. Um, I remember in the Arts Theatre I talked about 
some scenes where Blanche just ended up sort of doing laps around a sofa with this very repetitive dialogue with Bonnie, and that seems to have been fixed now. There weren't any moments where I took any issue with the staging. The one note I always have is I feel like Blanche leaves too soon during the song Dying Ain't So Bad, because I always feel like someone singing that kind of an exposing lyric to someone else um, is more powerful, and to have it just turn into a solo so quickly feels like they've lost some of the power. I feel like there's a balance there. Have her stay on stage for a bit, then have her leave a little bit later, then it becomes a solo for the build at the end because it's Bonnie talking to herself rather than she begins talking to Blanche and then so quickly talks to herself. I feel like some of those lyrics are more pointed when she gets to direct them at someone. But this leads me very nicely into talking about the performances. So let's talk about the cast. Jordan is tremendous as Clyde. I really enjoy his performance. He is doing that Kubrick stare thing and he is unhinged, but he finds a way to sort of smile through it. And we meet him at the beginning with this charm and this optimism, having just broken out of jail. But we very quickly get glimpses into the rage that lies beneath the surface and the force with which he delivers that, very believable. And he has some moments that are so raw, they are legitimately chilling. His delivery of Ray's Little Hell is spine-tinglingly good, not only fantastically sung as he's hitting these soaring tenor high notes that sound just fantastic, but the way his eyes are bulging out of his head and his neck veins are throbbing and he's screaming and backbending and just so committing himself to this role. There are moments where I wish he would grow a little bit more despondent because he does seem very plucky and optimistic throughout and it gets a little bit too lighthearted. I feel like his Clyde should start to feel a little bit heavier as time passes. I like that he has the smiley side and he can smile through things and that occasionally when he just does it with the one side of his mouth and his eyes work independently from his smile also very unnerving, very Joker-like. But I also feel the smiley demeanor lingers a little too long into the second act when things are beginning to go awry. Frances Mayla McCann is wonderful as Bonnie Parker. It's a brilliant, layered performance. And I feel even more in this run, she is delivering this level of ambition and narcissism. And what I love about her Bonnie is she is so quick to ignite with anger and she's just so passionate and she has to be played that way. You can't play her as reasonable. She has to be a hothead because there are these moments where she threatens to leave Clyde and she's packing and then she's kissing him and embracing him and completely doing a 180 on uh, her plans and her aspirations and what she's going to do with her life. And all of these decisions that she makes only really make any kind of sense when you play her as this willful romantic, which is what Frances Mayley McCann does and she has these beautiful vulnerable moments of course she also sings like a beautiful songbird with how about a dance and dying ain't so bad and just the way that she holds herself and the way that she's so poised but there's also this sadness and disappointment behind all of that but she's still committing to this life that she's dreamed of for herself where she wants to be this star and this it girl you can see all of that in her performance you can see her cleverness coming through, but also she's such a slave to her own ambition and her own narcissism and her ego when it becomes about her getting recognition and fame for being an accomplice to Clyde. So the other couple in this show are Buck and Blanche. Buck is Clyde's brother and Blanche is his very religious and very concerned wife. They are played by George Maguire and Jodie Steele. George is returning to this show. I really enjoy him in this role. I really like his voice. I've seen him in some other things as well. He lands some great comic moments. He doesn't really get the showier parts of the material, but he does a really great job playing this role. Jodie Steele as Blanche gets some lovely material, but she makes some very different decisions to Natalie McQueen, who played this role in its previous run. So Natalie gave a very broad comic performance with an accent that was very high-pitched and nasal, very Dolly Parton-esque. Jodie's has moments of sounding similar, but is generally a little bit lower, and a lot of the lines that Natalie just landed as a joke, Jody is steering in a different direction and she's going a little bit more meaningful. There's a line in particular where uh, she's having this sort of sassy interaction with 
a fellow parishioner at her church was judging her life choices for standing by a man who's gone to jail. And where previously her response to this had been a big laugh line, Jodie Steele is adding in this level of fragility and vulnerability, and she feels very tearful throughout. So what ends up happening with her character at the end of the show is sort of foreshadowed by this and maybe makes a little bit more sense. I will say that the way that she plays the end of Blanche's narrative is very affecting, it's heartbreaking. And it's a difficult character to balance because you can look through this material and she's so at odds with the tone of the show and everyone else in these scenes that she is in because they are all reasonably serious and she is very much the comic relief character. We go to her to get these funny, sassy moments where she's criticizing Bonnie and Clyde and the way that they live their life. But then very soon after this, we will have these very dark and serious things happening. And she ultimately gets drawn into that darkness as well. So it's a tricky thing to balance. And I understand and appreciate Jodie wanting to give her a little bit more humanity rather than just playing a clown. And she does throw herself into the comic moments as well. She's Jodie Steele. She's not afraid to do silly things and get laughs on stage. And she is very funny in a few moments, but there's not as many laughs as in the previous version of the show. Blanche is more of a rounded character. For better or for worse, that's definitely a difference. Two other things that Jodie Steele does particularly well that I want to shout out. Her singing the song, That's What You Call A Dream. This was never my favorite song in the show before, but she sings it so beautifully and so stirringly, and it sounds so lovely in her voice. It really made me take notice of this number. And she also fronts a little bit of the choreography in the gospel number, God's Arms Are Always Open. She does a great job of leading that as well because she's such a brilliant dance talent that commits with such determination to choreography that she is a brilliant person to lead it front and center. Dom Hartley Harris has joined this production as well, and he is singing the songs Made in America and God's Arms Are Always Open. Essentially, his role in this production is to come in and deliver us amazing gospel vocals on those two songs, which he does. He sounds fantastic and is a big part of why those songs are so great. A couple more people I want to mention. Cleve September plays Ted. He's very earnest. He's a little bit unchanging throughout the show. He doesn't have this duet with Frances Miller McCann as Bonnie anymore. He still sings a song about her and duets on the end of that with Jordan Luke Gage as Clyde. We begin to see a little bit more anger from him bubbling up in the second act, but I think he's still playing it as a reasonably docile character. So it doesn't emerge all that much. A little bit more variety might be nice there. Julie Yamini has joined this production in the ensemble and playing Bonnie's mother, and she is delightful. I am of the belief that Julie Yamini adds so much value to any show that she is in because she gets some fantastic moments. When she's playing one of the ladies at the hair salon in the song You're Going Back to Jail in the first act, when she's being Bonnie's mother and giving us seriousness and concern and she's shrieking at her daughter when she's giving us crazy high vocal lines in the start of the second act. Whatever she's doing, she's getting the job done. And we also have to talk about Pippa Winslow, who is playing Clyde's mother as well as Governor Ferguson. Two very different roles. We see her as a woman completely broken and guilt-stricken and just so human. And it's such a brilliant acting performance. And then the fury and the frustration that she comes in with as Governor Ferguson makes the entire audience sit up and take notice of those scenes. You want more of those police conversations, even though that's not really where her plot needs to be, just because she leads them with such conviction. She's such a strong presence in every scene that she is in. Pippa Winslow, fantastic. So there are a few really great moments in this show. And I think my favorite song changes every single time. Like I said, Jordan Luke Gage's Raise a Little Hell is brilliant. The reprise of Raise a Little Hell in the second act feels like this really great moment where we've really arrived at the culmination of what we understand Bonnie and Clyde to be. And it's them at the height of their notoriety. Frances Mayla McCann singing Dine Ain't So Bad is also just such a striking moment. Her delivery of that 
is wonderful. After seeing the show again tonight, I'm also going to add in the duet that Blanche and Bonnie share, which is called Love Who You Love. This is a beautiful song that I really enjoy and the way that they've done this stunning sort of night sky design behind them with a projection while they're singing it just makes it more of like a camp moment. In many Frank Wildhorn shows, you have this brilliant female duet moment and I feel like it's a great musical theater staple and this one really doesn't let us down either. I just love the melody of this, just giving you this musical theater power anthem excellence. I think tonally, this is a really different show to a lot of the ones that are currently on in the West End. If you're looking for something a little bit different, it is romantic in its own way. If you want to go and have like a Bonnie and Clyde date night, it's a little bit alternative as a show, but we still have the core things you expect in a musical. You have characters that you're going to get to know. You have this soaring score. You have tremendous vocals. You have like really gritty and meaty acting performances. You have comedy, you have romance, you have darkness, you have a little bit of social commentary. It offers you many different things. I feel like if you exist within a Venn diagram of liking musical theater and liking true crime, maybe this is a great show for you. If you're kind of like into more of like an indie type of a show, this is something that you should go and check out as well. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my thoughts about Bonnie and Clyde the musical at the Garrick Theatre. If you have already seen this production at the Garrick or if you got to see it at the Arts Theatre, comment down below with your thoughts about the show. If you did enjoy today's video, make sure to subscribe to my Stagey YouTube channel and don't forget about the links in the description down below. You can sign up